Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are going through the design way by Harold Nelson. Today, we are the chapter is Evil of Design. And many people here have said that this is their favorite chapter. Um, I'm honored to have uh, CJ here, uh, which is very, very special. Uh, he's been watching all the videos, commenting on it extensively, but this is wonderful that he's shown up here. So we're going to start with, uh, so folks, if you want to talk about what you got from this chapter, go ahead and type an exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom. We're going to start with, uh, let's start with Joe, Evanique, Mike, and then CJ. Joe, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, I mean, I did, I did like this chapter. Um, I think that it was pretty clear uh, on a number of levels, but the three areas of evil were very interesting to me. Um, the first aspect of it was natural evil and this idea that you're pushing beyond the boundaries and that you're creating something new. But I found what was especially interesting is that even if you design something that's really, uh, that really fits the need that you're trying to, to uh, service, then people will still maybe dislike it or reject it because it disrupts the norms of their everyday practices. So I thought about this in terms of the practical terms of how sometimes automation changes people's jobs and that that fundamentalist shift, it's the design itself makes everything more efficient and it accomplishes what its goal was. But then the people that are having to reinvent themselves are fighting against it. So the designer becomes seen as this individual that is not somebody that you really appreciate. So the design itself was just not appreciated. The second uh, part was the accidental evil. Um, and I immediately thought of Akhoff's uh, uh, figure in 1411 uh, was where he talks about uh, data, information, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And while the authors really focus on the idea of understanding within that context, um, it, it, it's, it's a really important point. And I tried to come up with something where people had started out with these good intentions and then didn't necessarily understand all the factors uh, where and what, their, what essentially their, their design may uh, result into a negative outcome. So the one example, I actually had quite a few examples, but I was trying to come up with a really easy one to understand was uh, the uh, inventors of something like DDT and where they were trying to stop uh, something where they can control the spread of malaria and they were spraying you know people with ddt and uh there was even a swiss chemist that was awarded the nobel prize uh, for this invention um but then they found out that they were killing all the microorganisms the birds and essentially causing cancer to people so it was a lack of understanding that what they were intending to do they were trying to rid of the world of a disease and that they essentially didn't necessarily understand the problem or the full implications of what they were actually doing. Um, and the last one I'll be brief on is that this idea of willful evil. And this is like power uh, without any charity or community. Uh, that's what they, how the authors put it. And it's essentially where the ends justify the means and, and people uh, will essentially do whatever they have to do in order to, uh, to uh, maintain their power structure. And um, what I thought about with that was just one example is I think of predatory pricing uh, when you're suppressing competition in a market and you're essentially saying, so there was an example of Walmart and Target where Walmart was holding their prices artificially low for prescription drugs. And it was only doing it for the short run in order to capture the market over the long run. And so that it was willfully, it was strategic and it was intentional and it's meant to dominate the market and it actually doesn't take into account any of the community. Uh, and so that was one example of, uh, of each of the three uh, major uh, categories that were outlined in this chapter. There's a lot more to it, but 
I'll leave it there. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next up is going to be uh, Evanique, Mike, and CJ. Evanique. Yeah. Um, so I, the first thing I was looking at was the quote where it says, in any creative act, something new is brought into the world at the expense of the old, which is then destroyed. And I was thinking a bit about that. And now I was, now I was like, that helped me really get the chapter of uh, the evil of design. And the reason why it helped me was because it helped me see how other people would view it. So when you're bringing something new and creating something new, something old has to go away. I think Joe referred to it earlier when he talked about the loss of jobs with automation as an example. And that's perfect because it, and to recognize that, yeah, it is an evil to some people's world because you're taking away their jobs and everything they know, and now they have to create themselves anew. We see this today happening in retail uh, where cashiers are being replaced by self-checkout. And on the one hand, it's really convenient. You don't have to wait. But on the other hand, for people who are depending on that for income to feed their families, this is definitely an evil. And I think in some cases you can mitigate it. And maybe, you know, maybe we need to think about mitigating it a bit more and seeing it coming. Like, you know, it's going to come. It's one of the reasons why you're doing it. But also to maybe mitigate it, maybe help train people in other areas, you know, ha have them still be a benefit. So I think you have to look at it that way. And I think there was another one quote where it says, there are always unintended consequences associated with new designs, many of which can be quite negative. And I think that's so true. And I think the unintended ones are the harder ones to, con to contend with because you don't see them coming and you have to react to them right away. And you can try to predict certain things that'll happen and try to mitigate it. But when you can't, I think what would be good to, is to create a system or like maybe factor it into your design that there are going to be unintended consequences and how you're going to deal with them. That way you can either lessen the impact on the people or just lessen the impact on the design itself. So um, overall, I just thought this chapter was very easy to read. I really got it. Um, understanding the evils of design, or I would say the negative, because I think of evil as deliberate, but I would say, think, I would have renamed it thinking of the negative consequences of design and how it's going to impact other people. And I think the, what the author is calling you to do is to really think about that in your design. That way you can mitigate it if you can, because, you know, design is meant to be for the good of people. So I liked it. I liked the way it, it worked. So I'm done. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Evanik. Uh, next up is going to be Mike, followed by CJ. Mike. Yeah, I was listening when uh, people were lining up tonight. It sounds like a whole bunch of us really sunk our teeth into, into this chapter. Um, there were some quotes that I really found helpful. Uh, one was that new designs always bring shadows with them. And I don't know if they were intending like a Jungian attachment to the shadow self, but I think it exists in the real world. You know, I'm looking at, I don't know, 30 faces here. And if we were designing something but there was money on the line or prestige if I was gonna be publishing a paper based on what we're doing here or being compensated for my work, all of a sudden now there's, there's a bit of a conflict. I still have the whole in mind and I want my, my contribution here to pay off, but I also have that side of me where my self-interest is in place. So as I'm listening to everybody's comments tonight and noting their contributions, if for some reason there was someone that may be competing with me in the same company, I mean competing in a good way, would my shadow self take over and maybe not compliment that person to the level to which they deserve? I wouldn't say anything negative, but me by maybe being silent, um, is that a, a form of evil? They, they use the word evil, not with a capital E. So, so would I be actually doing something wrong by maybe not complimenting someone? The flip side of that might, what if I am in simpatico with somebody here and I compliment them too much? I, I, I don't know if that makes sense where, where there are all of these underlying aspects that nobody really knows about because it's my shadow self that's also getting involved. 
And I'll finish with this. I can't think of a better uh, case study of, uh, matter of fact, I think it's so profound that they should write a third edition. I would love to see the COVID response to both treatment and prevention of COVID, the design of those two, how does that fit in? Because think about the millions and millions of dollars that are changing hands based on a decision of something that I am designed to prevent COVID or the treatment of COVID. I think that's gonna make for a fascinating, fascinating case study in the business schools, in the medical journals, philosophy, I, I just, it goes on and on. And I think that a COVID view through the design way is, is maybe a whole new meetup. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Next up is going to be uh, CJ followed by Charlie and Maritza. Uh, CJ, please take your time. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I can comment on Evanique and- uh, No, let's, I wanna hear I'm what you have to say. We'll have plenty of ch chance to comment. You're right, speak. I'm not going to. Um, th this chapter, I think, is is very profound i think it gets to a fundamental truth about being human being an agent in the world that fundamentally everything we do in my interpretation both creates splendor and evil we can't have one without the other almost and the way I came into this interpretation in, I think it was 2007 or 2008, my friend Tom Miller in New York City introduced me to the expression, both neither. Very often in business, uh, in this meetup group, we often emphasize both and, and get into this um, you know, seeing how things that are different are complementary and can be integrated in a syntactic view. Um, both neither is a different kind of logic. Both neither is the logic of yes, both, but no, not either. <laughs> both of them have a shortcoming. And, and I think that implies to splendor and evil in design. I, I almost think as a matter of principle, we can assert that everything everyone does has both splendorous and evil aspects. Inherently, without your control, you don't get a say. Yes, maybe you can mitigate some of the evil so that so that that doesn't happen. But as the chapter emphasizes, no matter what you do, it occludes and prevents the other alternatives that could have happened and they get shortchanged in some sense. So so there's at least that evil. But there are often many other evils. And another thing that helped me um, get to this deeper interpretation was there's a book by William Byers, How Mathematicians Think. It's subtitle, I forget the exact words, but it has the words ambiguity, contradiction, and paradox. And the, the implication is that ambiguity, contradiction, and paradox are essential in the creation of mathematics. I'll I'm planning to use that book as the basis of my February 16th um, essay and event at 52 Living Ideas and the Thinking Society. That William Byers, the, the Buddhist mathematician, um, this recognition that there's fundamental paradox in mathematics, such, such as the number zero. Zero is the nothing that is, it is, but it's nothing. You know, there's a fundamental paradox there. And, and uh, Byers recommends that we embrace paradox. And that's exactly what uh, the, the chapter in the book says. 
It says there are all these paradoxes of design. And instead of resolving them and solving them, we almost need to embrace them. And the splendor and evil of design is, is perhaps the most profound paradox of design that always and only coexist. And, and that gets to my third uh, prerequisite. Actually, it came a little after um, reading The Design Way. I, I learned that subjective and objective always and only coexist. They're fundamentally paradoxical. The more and more objective you get, it, you're more and more subjective. The more and more subjective you become, you want to highlight your subjectivity, it results in inherent objectivity. <laughs> the, there are these paradoxes that in our tradition, we usually try to uh, neutralize and, and contain. And, and to some extent we do. Very often we come up with ways of thinking that transcend the paradox. And in mathematics, we can use the number zero without even re realizing that it's paradoxical. So I, I think this chapter with, you know, I want to put the splendor on design equal to the evil of design. They're both there. Neither, you know, they're both there and neither one is there in some sense, because when you focus on the evil, you forget about the splendor. When you focus on the splendor, you forget about the evil. It's, it's like both and neither um, to and I hear the book, the chapter, and I would concur and, and argue that we should engage and embrace the both, neither, the paradox, the coexisting subjectivity and objectivity of the splendor and evil. We need to acknowledge it. I see mistake mystique, this notion I've been uh, talking about in some of my events, that there's an inherent gap in what we know, um, what we say, how we communicate, and in what we do, how we design. There's always a gap. And mistake mystique is the recognition that this gap is something we need to pay attention to, we need to acknowledge, we need to embrace. And when we do so, we look square at the evil we have done and have done and will do, and the splendor that we have done, are doing, and will do. Yeah, you, 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 Don't forget about the splendor and go into a um, depressive, manic, you know, state focusing on the evil, there's a balance. And, and I think that's, that's what I'm hearing the, the chapter uh, talk about. And, and the chapter argues at the end that the splendor of design in some way is bigger or slightly encompasses the evil. Uh, I'm not sure that's true. Um, but I will say that Buckminster Fuller had a similar idea that the integrative forces are always greater than the dispersive and destructive forces. Um, it may be true. It's an interesting hypothesis about the nature of the universe, whether integrity and pulling things together and making things splendorous will always encompass the evil. But you're never going to get away from the evil. It's inherent. And by looking at it, I think it makes us humble. It makes us realize whenever we engage in any effort that we hope will be mostly splendorous, there's something that I don't see that, that I might not see in my lifetime, but that someone at some time will recognize as the evil I have done. And I think that that puts one in the frame of humility, of, of recognizing 
that, you know, um, please help me. If you see it, let me know, <laughs> like, you know, please. Um, and uh, let me see, is that what I wanted to say? Um, yeah, I think I think that encompasses it. Um, one one more uh, point. Um, I'm reading Frankenstein right now, and and I think that novel um, uh, applies um, here. He's so focused on the science, and he's getting into the science. And wow, I know I can do it, but he never thought about what happens when I succeed. And then he succeeds and he's like, oh my God, I created a monster. <laughs> um, when, when we acknowledge the evil that will happen, even when we succeed, that puts us in the framework, the frame of mind to take a pause and to see what we can do to make sure we can't, you know, improve, you know, do a little bit better. So that that's my take on the essence of the chapter as a broad human agent issue. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. Wonderful to have you here. Folks, uh, those uh, 52 living ideas, folks who have not watched his CJ's presentations. CJ has amazing series of presentations uh, in the comprehensivist series on 52 living ideas. And he's done more than I think 20 odd presentations. So you can see them all in the comprehensivist uh, playlist. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Charlie, Maritza, Mike, um, JJ and Becky. So, Charlie. Uh, Charlie, you need to unmute. Oh, just a second, my, my fault. There is a problem. Give me just a second, okay? Hold on, my fault. All right, go right ahead, Charlie. Okay, um, first of all, I want to say that I emphatically agree with what uh, CJ did in pointing out that uh, this um, uh, this point about about uh, these these opposites coming together is is uh, the central uh, uh, most important idea in the chapter. However, I I don't didn't want to comment on it because I don't feel like I'm really at a point where I feel qualified to talk about it. But I will mention that I'm reading this book uh, uh, by uh, Ian McGilchrist, his most recent book, and he has a chapter on life on, on, on biology. And, uh, and on the coincidence of opposites, where he goes into in some detail. And uh, that, that subject matter of the coincidence of opposites is, is not trivial. I mean, it's pretty complicated, it's pretty deep. And, uh, and so um, I'm kind of struggling with it to, to kind of get my mind around that idea of how, that, you know, how, to, how to understand that. And uh, so, but the, there was one thing, he did make a comment about Aldous Huxley and the perennial philosophy. And I think it was a little bit unfair uh, in the sense that, that uh, things have developed. I mean, uh, uh, Aldous Huxley was a polymath and, uh, and, and uh, he knew quite a bit about biology and so on. And, 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 but things have progressed a lot. And uh, in, in particular, in terms of understanding life as a, as a uh, flow, as a process. And, uh, uh, and, and so um, one of the things that you can say, well, first of all, I, I think it's important to point out that, that whenever you talk about uh, good and evil, you're it, almost, you're, you're dealing with metaphysics about what you think is real, and then values that go along with your metaphysics, they kind of go like hand in glove sort of thing. And, uh, and, and one of the ways of looking at life uh, is the chapter that uh, Ian McGilchrist does on life is really interesting, because it, it's a, like a conversation amongst all the species. So it's, it's not like one species is competing against another species, like the survival of the fittest, but it's a general cooperative kind of, you know, a, a, a conversation between all the life forms that are on this planet. And, uh, and, and one of the things that, that all life has in common is one value, and that is to continue to live. And, uh, and, and so the, 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 for me, one of the most important foundations of an understanding of good and evil 
is um, whether or not you uh, can understand the one as being all of life on the planet, okay? That, that, that's what the one is in, in the spiritual sense. I mean, you can include, you know, the rocks and stuff, and there's animism and things like that, but, but really when it comes down to the nitty gritty, that there's this relationship of all of life with the self and with the planet, okay? So you have the resources that, that life depends on. And so if in your understanding, uh, if you just put it into a social, socio-cultural context and, and try to understand it from that point of view, uh, then I think you're going to get lost. I mean, because there, there's, uh, you know, there is, there were, you know, like for instance, okay, the, the killing of the wolves in, in, in Yellowstone Park turned out to be a mistake. And, 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 and so that they, they, this whole idea of cultural or biodiversity is very important. And, and so that a simplistic kind of way of thinking of, of being, you know, like a human centric, uh, it, or uh, uh, there's a word for it, I forget, oh, uh, uh, Anthropocene, you know, the period that we're going through right now is the Anthropocene period where human beings have become just totally self-absorbed and they don't give a crap about anything else but themselves. And uh, to me, that's evil. That's an, that's an example of, of, of an evil way of thinking. And, uh, and so that, uh, this idea of the religious uh, concept of the one uh, is is really relevant in, in, in a very practical sense because that's where we're seeing some of the examples that were given earlier about the, about the destruction of the environment with DDT and so on that, that the mindset is something that also that Ian McGilchrist has pointed out is this mechanistic materialist way of thinking and uh, and it separates us from from life and uh, it, it, it takes away the soul it's a soul destroying way of thinking and uh, the Buddhism has got, got a good way of putting it. You know, you got the extreme is nihilism on one side where nothing matters. Okay, you just do whatever you want. And the other is extreme eternalism or dogmatism where there's only one way to do things. And that's, you know, that, that's the dogmatist way. But so you got to find some way through the middle, you know, and, and, and it's it's hard. Okay, it's, it's, it's not, you're not going to find a rule book and says, well, this is the right way to do things. You got to, you know, kind of figure things out as you go along. It's uh, living is kind of like a flying by the seat of your pants, but there are some basic things that that uh, that that are you know that like the concept of the one is 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 something that's that is a, a good foundation for for understanding good and evil. And, but anyway, that's you know. But I, I I'm I'm really glad that CJ brought that up because I you know, about the coincidence of opposites because I think that's a really really important uh, 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 thing to think about. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, next up is going to be um, Maritza, and then it'll be Mike, JJ, and Becky. Maritza. Hi. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Fantastic. So um, this chapter, I find that we, we have spent quite a bit of time here together talking about how so many things are neither inherently good nor inherently evil. This chapter specifically is reminding you that if that is true, what is also true is that within us resides the potentiality for both good and evil. They both exist. Now we've touched lightly or and or indirectly upon this, you know, when we're contemplating the yin and the yang, the order, the chaos, you know, and CJ here was just speaking of um, opposites. This we've touched upon it, but I find that this chapter was the author's way of not leaving that to chance to make absolute certain that we understood that if we are picking up the mantle and accepting the title of designer, we have to know that we walk with both. It already exists within you. And as you go forth, moving forward, and remember, we already discussed that everything we touch has some, it leaves a mark. Everything we touch, touches us. And everything that touches us, we touch. That we've already discussed and hear what it's saying. And because of that, if you have within you both good and evil, everything you touch gets a little bit of both. And so these very few pages make so powerful a statement and it also, again, it boils down to this very powerful concept of the multiple perspectives. C CJ has um, walked us through considering multiple hypotheses. We've looked at these aspects of, if you look in one direction and one direction only, 
there is so much that you will miss. Your design will be improved by looking in more than one direction. And what we're told here in this chapter is that one should always make the assumption that it's an if then statement. If you are seeing the good and you don't see the evil, it doesn't mean that it's not there. You're not seeing it, but assume it's there so that when it rears its head, you are not caught unawares. We have those who have walked um, together discussing uh, Jordan Peterson. He's told us about the idea of, you know, if you plan for whatever contingency you can, you know, if you, if you go through and do the test, and this is also, this is a stoic concept. If you go through the exercise of imagining the worst that could happen, when it does happen, you are not as shocked. You don't find yourself to be as unprepared because it's a contingency that you have already considered as a possibility. We fall into trouble when we think that we have identified all the potential outcomes of a situation and we move forward with that certainty. Because invariably, there's going to be a situation that you may not have considered. But if you attempt to view them, then you're in a better position. And that, that's here. That's the, so evil, there are evils. And I, I really, really like the chart that shows us the um, categories of evil design. That's figure 11.2. And you know, the unavoidable are those that are out of necessity. And why is that? Because remember, you are neither good nor evil but the potential for both reside within you. Those are unavoidable, right? Um, and then there's the accidental evil. And that's where probably most of us will find ourselves. And those are the ones that through preparation, we can, if not avoid, we can wield to limit the scope of damage or error. And as designers, what I believe we're being told here in this chapter is that this is where we need to focus. The accidental evils happen when we make the assumption that the knowledge we have is complete. If we move forward, and I love CJ's use of the word humility. If we move forward with humility, what we're doing is we're assuming that our knowledge is incomplete. And if one moves forward, assuming that you don't have all the pieces, then you're in an open position and you're so much more willing to be told you're wrong. Or if you're, if you're already walking, expecting that the next step is going to break, you're treading more lightly and you're less apt to do yourself damage. That's the message here. Tread as though you know you don't have every answer. Because guess what? You don't have every answer. Nobody does. So remember that and move forward with that in mind. And the evils will find you. They're always going to. But if we move forward with the knowledge that we don't have all the answers, when the evil finds us, we are in a place more suited to pivot or to mitigate the damage because you already knew that you didn't have all the answers and you already knew that you could not foresee everything. And if that's your assumption as you move forward designing, then you're, it's so much easier to let go of that idea because we've spoken also about falling in love with your idea. If you hold it too tightly, it's too rigid and you cannot pivot. And that's that becomes something evil because then you also have the danger of sliding into a willful evil. Because if you're falling in love with your idea and then as you're moving forward with your baby clutched so tightly in your hand and then you realize that there is a massive error in your design baby, if you're holding too tightly, you will 
want to keep holding on and moving forward because now you're like, I'm going to get it done, move forward. The problem with that is that now you are willingly moving forward and taking the evil with you. And why? Because you thought you had all the answers. And when you realized that you did not, you cared more for what you believed to be the solution than you did for the, I suppose it would be the ethical idea or responsibility of restructuring the design to cut out that evil that was identified. Because what if you find more evil down the road after that? So that's kind of what I, I saw here in this chapter, the, the idea. And I, I do love, there's a figure called acceptance and design. And that's another great word here, acceptance. So the concept here is there's no way to never find evil. That world doesn't exist. If you find that that world exists, be very afraid because either you're lying to yourself or those around you are lying to you. It's just that simple. There's no way. So that being said, it's okay. Accept that. Accept that in order to create something not yet in existence, which is what our goal is, right? Let's not forget that. That's the goal here. We're the design animals that we are is yearning for creation of something new. This creation, it's hard. It's scary. It's an unknown. There's going to be pitfalls. But if you accept that when you begin, then you can not get stuck once you see it happen because you won't be blindsided. Because even if you don't know what it is that's going to trip you up, assume that something will. And then you just keep moving. The, I, I really like the acceptance because it's just a couple ones and they read almost like motivational slogans. You know, it's like accept challenge of design. And that tells us there's no right answers, there's no givens, there's no comprehensive. Accept the power of design, which means you're creating a real world. The real world is not perfect. Accept responsibility of design. We are, are not in a bubble. We serve the community. We serve the culture. We serve the clients. Accept paradoxes of design. CJ did a fantastic job. The, the both all or the neither nor. Accept discipline at design, your skill, your engagement, your limits, and your focus. Accept potential of design. You're, you know, you're creating something new, something beautiful, evolution, desire, infinite possibilities. Again, there's nothing perfect here. So those are the acceptance items of design that are pointed out here. And, and it's just a really strong way of telling us that the meaning and the value in a design comes from this risk. If you're not vulnerable to the reality of the potential good and evil within your design, then are you actually walking that design process. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Uh, folks, we are going to have an intermission here because Robert had this amazing diagram last time and I screwed up on the technology. The sound was not clear. I was so interested in the diagram that I didn't, I ignored the fact that the sound was not perfect. So now we have got it all set up so that the sound is going to be fantastic. Robert, are you ready? Can I go ahead and start the PowerPoint? Can you go ahead and unmute? I'm going to check your sound. Go ahead. OK. OK, your I'm sound ready. is good. And give me just a second. I'm going to stop sharing here. Give me a second. Uh, too many windows open. Hold on. Let me get it started here here all right okay um forget what i said last time if you heard any of it let's start all over um 
view this multicolored object here as a ribbon. Uh, it has width and a certain amount of depth, but it's highly flexible. And the inside edge of that ribbon is hemmed, it's held together. And the outside edge is sometimes frayed, sometimes raveled, sometimes held together. The green line with the dots on it is the arrow of time, and the dots represent, uh, you know, uh, time intervals as the arrow of time progresses. Those dots also occur on the ribbon edge, and those are the uh, time intervals of the um, of the um, project time. In other words, the length of the ribbon, as you can see, is longer than the arrow of time. And that uh, ribbon length is the project time. Um, the elapsed time it shows there would be a bar that goes across the face of the ribbon or a line that goes across the face of the ribbon representing uh, activities and individuals acting at the same time, simultaneity across the uh, movement of progress down the ribbon. The top of the ribbon is non-existent. That is what we call the um, a priori part of design. It's what's built in. It's the um, everything that you are already instituted with. It's your health, ecology, your faith, your worldview. Uh, your um, uh, universal laws and mindset. There's um, motivation. There's logic, social influence. And I would like to throw in, because of the discussion we're having today, passion and courage and self-knowledge. Those things are what, those three things or what can combat the evil of design. So I know self be true, then you can, uh, uh, and uh, always know that as um, Marissa was saying, that the evil of design is always there. Be prepared for it, look for it, seek it out. <clears throat> Later on, there'll be some uh, more information about that. Um, the purple represents the, well, the colors represents the different stages of design and that's enumerated over on the right hand side. Um, but the beginning stage we call uh, philosophy and theory because that's setting the basis for the designer. And I'm gonna use that term in the plural sense because it could be an individual it could be a whole community, whatever the issue uh, in, asks, requires for engagement. Um, as you, you begin to come together as, as uh, that designer, uh, you, you develop fundamental knowledge and systems thinking, you use those, you immediately run into the paradox issue because no, before you even have a client, there's gonna be opposition built into the system and you're gonna to have to recognize it and learn how to deal with it from the very beginning. So don't fool yourself just because everything are hunky-dory when you sign the contract. That's just the beginning. Um, the other aspects of this uh, continue on. You. Uh, have to deal with on the uh, interior edge of the ribbon, you have to deal with um, loop rules, regulations, laws, fixed um, quantities like uh, materials or uh, money or whatever, uh, constraints basically, uh, and they form that boundary all the way down through the process. After you become engaged in the process, you will uh, create a contract with your clients. And from that, 
you will uh, develop among the whole group a uh, appreciation for the desiderata, which would also mean the um, um, the what I call a strange attack tractor, that thing that you're seeking to design, but has, as we say, not yet does not yet exist, but has presence in the drive of the whole unity of the uh, whole operation, the whole um, effort. As you move down in the arrow of time, uh, you begin to uh, pass through the engagement phase, which I talked about at, where you uh, establish the contract with the, uh, with the uh, client and you set the time frames and the budget and uh, the legal aspects and so forth. Um, you have, uh, you begin open dialogue with the, uh, the, um, design participants and you set uh, targets and uh, objectives along the way. Some instances you create a mission statement and that sort of thing. Uh, and at the end of that, in the beginning of the preparation, you, de you develop in one form or another a prospectus, which is some kind of documentation or uh, some kind of commitment as to what you're up to. Now here, as soon as you put that into existence, evil of design rears its ugly head and says, oh, you're gonna tear up my town or you're gonna do whatever you're gonna do, which is gonna upset me and I'll have none of it. And then you'll be faced with the, uh, different types of evil that we've been discussing. <clears throat> and that can vary within the organization, within your design group. And it can be, of course, from outside the design group. The frayed edge of the uh, ribbon at that point is very receptive to receiving uh, negative input as well as positive input. So you wanna be able to understand that and move accordingly. What we've done sometimes is, as in the design context is at this stage, we appoint uh, different people to do different uh, jobs and so forth, of course. And one of the things is we choose a person or a group of people to be what I, I call the court jester. And their purpose, their intention is to be critical, but to be fairly critical and bring forth all of the negatives they can think of. In other words, they're the opposition. And they can actually, on very complex designs, they can go out in the community and join in the community and find out exactly what the negatives are that you're going to be faced with and bring them back to the design team. And they're the court jester because the design team cannot hold them responsible and blame them or cut them off because they don't want to hear it. The court jester works at the uh, pleasure of the king and can't be beheaded except by the king. Um, in addition to that, you will um, move on into the preparation then and I'm only you know just touching the surface on this but I kind of want to focus on the negativity uh, and the dark side of design because that's what we're talking about. Um, in the preparation phase this is where you set the work and you do all of your uh, reviews and organizational learning you uh, you do your research and uh, meet with the team members, have discussions and dialogue, um, and you wind up with the prospectus now being a document that's more like a journal. It's recording 
being recorded uh, by someone in the design group and or so, more persons than one and kept as if it were a diary of the whole project. We learned early on in some of the design work we've done in the past that what happens is you get partway through the design, you've committed a lot of effort and energy and money and so forth to the design and the client changes for whatever reason. And if you don't have this historical document, this diary to carry along with you in a very complex and complicated design effort, you're gonna be lost. You have to start all over or may have to start all over anyway, but at least with a prospectus, you're able to uh, justify where you are now and find a compromise perhaps where you will be going forward. Um, moving into the immersion phase, um, this is where you um, engage in the actual um, comprehension of what the design effort is all about. You're doing your research, you're scoping, sweeping in ideas and elements from the outside. Uh, and you do a lot of exchange of ideas and information. There's a use of um, feedback that you're getting from your outreach to the community or to the, uh, uh, to the stakeholders and those people. And you also get ideas that actually are feed forward ideas, which are represented by the uh, rainbow arrow there uh, that goes from the blue to the green, where an idea comes to fore, but it's not ready for it. Uh, you're not ready for it. It's not timely in the design process, but you, again, refer to the prospectus and put that idea into the prospectus so you can use it later on or consider it later on as you move on um, down the process. Um, then there's, I want to get a note here. Uh, when you're in the immersion process, this is when the apprehension of the evil of design comes into play. This is where you really have to grasp what's happening with the uh, evil of design. And I think I can just show this because it's fairly simple. That's a diagram. I don't, can you see that all right? Uh, I'm going to stop sharing so you can people can see it clearly. Go ahead. Oh, okay. What that is, is there's a blue line and there's a, a what is the other line? <laughs> a blue line and a green line. I don't know if you can see the green line and an orange line. Yep. The blue line, consider that as a track of the opposition. And the green line would be the track of the design team and their all of their side of the equation. But those two oppositions do intersect at times and create nodes where they intersect and that's what the orange line is which then becomes a uh, oper uh, opportunity to mitigate the design and uh, in essence uh, offset the nature of the uh, negative design i uh, had one experience where my boss's boss was an engineer and he hated architects and he made it known that he didn't like architects. And we were working on a design. We'd built a model. He'd come in and looked at it. He'd grunt and groan and move on. And came time for us to present it to the, to the people that were getting it. And uh, I noticed that he and, and one of the, other engineers are in the back of the room, totally engaged in conversation and pointing in my direction and so forth. And I brought the model uh, that we'd made and I put it on top of a Coke machine at, 
at the side of the office or the place where we were meeting. And we got into the design and the first thing they did was they said, well, you didn't do it like we wanted it. We wanted you to do this, that, and the other thing. And, find, and it was a setup basically. So I told them, okay, we have to back up now. We have to consult the prospectus and go back where we started and regain that information that you're now feeding to us, which we didn't have before. And I never let them look at the, at the model. Uh, they weren't happy, but it worked because we were able to go back and modify the model and bring it into a conformance with the things that they had used as opposition. That was intentional evil design. And it can happen in places that you don't expect. So you have to be able to just live with what happens and go with the flow. So after immersion comes divergence. This is where you, uh, you're now a, a cohesive group, more or less. You are a cohort or you are a design group and you are operating in the dialogue mode. You know what you're talking about, who you're talking to, and you have uh, a, your own, you know, it gets to the point if you use the same design team, often you answer each other's questions or finish each other's sentences. It can be that close. But in the divergence phase, you're opening up again and you're sweeping in anything you can, uh, find that might be loose and might be important. That's when you do uh, more inquiry and opening out and you sharpen your skills and your, uh, your information and, and your intuition. Intuition follows you all along this line, all along this curve where you're picking up signals uh, and, and, you know, you've got knowledge behind you and you've got experience behind you and you've got passion behind you and you've got your intuition that tells you that you know those two guys in the back of the room aren't your buddies so intuition plays a big role all the way down and in the uh, combat with the uh, dark side then we move into uh the convergence phase where you this is where the system becomes totally bounded. It's been an open system until this point, but now you have to use your design judgment and shut the system, uh, close the, the raveled edge of the, of the ribbon so that uh, you can focus on the design effort. And out of that comes the emergence of the total conception the ideation, the uh, creative aha moment, and the party. All of that happens within the emergence phase. And uh, it becomes, at that point, uh, you of course have been working with the clients and stakeholders all along, but at that point, uh, you present the idea to them and uh, work with them as to their response to it and then move on into development of the idea. And again, at that point, the, the edge of the ribbon's frayed again because you're opening up the um, system to receiving new and important information. If, if it's a building, you know, this is your technical, your structural, your heating, your air conditioning, your laws, rules, regulations, all of that sort of thing. If it's a social thing, you're uh, going out to the community and eliciting feedback uh, and information and uh, selling them basically on the idea. And it's at that point, I'll tell you another story where we had a building at that stage all set to go uh, at uh, Lake Tahoe. And it was on the on public land between two uh, housing developments of uh, co condominiums. And we 
had hearings all over the Bay Area and Sacramento and so forth and in Tahoe and everything was going fine. And we had one meeting in San Francisco and the suits showed up. There was a room full of lawyers. And it turned out that the lawyers were representing the people who had the condominiums on either side of the project. And they, after we made our presentation, they said, well, you can dream all you want because we are gonna bring a lawsuit against this and it'll never get off the ground. And sure enough, it never got off the ground. But they, theirs again was a situation where we were totally blindsided by the dark side and the project disappeared. Of course, when you're working with the government, that happens a lot. You get blindsided quite a bit from areas that you can't do anything about. But if you survive the development stage, that's when you can bring out the, uh, the ultimate particular, your whole composition and explain the emergent qualities and so forth that uh, it becomes a reality, whether it's a outcome or a physical uh, object, that is where it is introduced to the public or to the world. And of course, once it's introduced, then you're back in the design mode because there will be in a, uh, innovation is the introduction stage, but it'll be followed up by uh, questions and critiques, which you then uh, evaluate, modify, and uh, reiterate. All, and reiteration is an important aspect of this because you're constantly iterating back and forth among the, the uh, different stages. Even when you get down into the later stages, you may have to go back up into engagement or preparation and, and work with something out of that stage. It's a constantly, uh, it's dynamic and it's constantly changing. And the, the uh, emergence is never what you expect when you start out. It always changes by all those factors along the way. <clears throat> so I guess that's uh, about all I wanted to say. <laughs> Wonderful, Ro Robert. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think doing this twice, I think helped because first time we had we had all of that, but I think this was very deep and, and this is very valuable because coming from somebody who has gone through this process so many times and is familiar with issues involved at every stage. This was just very, very useful, sir. I still use this diagram all the time. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Robert. All right, folks, now uh, we'll continue with uh, Mike, JJ, and Becky, uh, Becky, then David, and then Chen. Mike, what did you get from this chapter? Well, uh... Robert's uh, speech was a tough, uh, tough act to follow, except for some of the things that I uh, was going to say uh, depended on uh, my interpretation of uh, his speech last time, of his presentation last time. So uh, 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 I'll try to compress eight minutes of talk into 75 seconds. Wonderful. Um, uh, the first thing is, um, quoting Shakespeare, nothing is good or evil, save thinking make it so. So you, you don't, uh, there isn't, uh, uh, what's evil may not be what we think it's evil. And that comes out of Plato's allegory of the cave, um, <clears throat> that reality is never what you think it is. And... Uh, Part of that is because, as Robert Spiral Dynamics uh, discussed, um, the uh, design is a sequential decision process. And um, you, until you take the first step, you don't know whether you're creating uh, gold or whether you're creating a disaster down the road. Um, uh, some of the comments that have been made uh, imply that uh, 
uh, we should reevaluate the process with what we've done with COVID. But DDT is also an example of um, uh, of uh, a, of uh, the how we created it, the application of it, and then the blanket banning of it. Uh, every step along the way, we created disasters that uh, had we known what we were doing, uh, we wouldn't have created it, and it probably should not have been banned quite blanket-wise because because uh, some of the the some of the diseases that DDT prevented uh, killed more people than DDT did. Thalidomide is a similar bio bioethics thing. What could you give? A, a pregnant woman that would uh, eliminate pain uh, without any side effects, and they came up with a perfect painkiller, except it didn't uh, it did bad things to the fetus. Um, now, this sequential decision process is uh, an OODA loop type thing. You don't know what you don't know until you take the first step. And then you may tell, it may not be till five steps down the road that you realize you should have backtracked. And by that time, it may be prohibitive to backtrack. Uh, and uh, so you don't go back and you just plow through and create what you can create so you finish within budget, uh, uh, on time and within budget, which is a big thing. Uh, the OODA loop was that kind of situation. Um, a, a variant of that uh, is that you uh, can analyze a design completely with uh, particularly in structural engineering with finite element analysis. But finite element analysis assumes a trial design. It's not a synthesis of what the design ought to be. Uh, every, uh, uh, so, well, and the problem is we don't have a one-step global optimization scheme to fix these problems. Thank you. I, uh, Thank one you. More, one more sentence, and then I'll wrap sure. up. I haven't used sure. my 75 seconds yet. And, uh, and uh, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, quantum computers uh, embedded in the collapse of the wave function will give a multi-stage decision process a meaningful thing a meaningful analysis in one machine cycle would I and continue evaluate many alternate solutions in the same way that the crypto people hope that it's going to break all kinds of codes and uh, because you get evaluate all the solutions globally and then uh, uh, instead of sequentially step by step by step by step. thank you uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is going to be uh, JJ, followed by Becky, David, and finally, Jeng. So JJ, what did you get from the chapter? Uh, yeah, well, I basically think that um, the whole idea of unavoidable evil um, made me think of different types of evils, too. So that's something that I haven't really um gotten to hear much about and and that's kind of crucial for me that's all i want to say thank you also and on self-forgiveness and forgiving others as well i think it's important because we can't really completely um avoid um stepping on things and and being destructive in some way indirectly or directly Thanks. Wonderful. wonderful thank you thank you jj next up is uh, becky becky go ahead Greetings from Germany. Oh, welcome. <laughs> I, was hoping, <laughs> I was hoping Tom would be on, so I'm not the only one calling in at 4.11. <laughs> um, so I um, have a few thoughts on this, and uh, I'll start with um, the part where, uh, I'll go in order um, with the, the natural, um let's see the natural evil and uh, Mar marisa had said it so well um you know whenever you create something something else gets displaced and um 
and what I've encountered often is this part where um, the separation can be detected in the removal of self from the whole through reasoning, will, and feeling. That's more of um, the other, the latter two, uh, the accidental evil and the willful evil. But the first one, um, it's not, it, it always exists. And that's the, um, that's where, where it's more subjective because I think it's the perspective of, of if it's evil and it feels evil uh, for the people who have to change their behavior. But if it's communicated well and uh, the change is adopted quickly through uh, the, through changing your mind before the creation is uh, comes into reality, then it it helps to mitigate that. And um, let's see, the form of design evil can be perilous to designer. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find the part that I wanted to read. Oh, my apologies. Uh, Okay, uh, this form of design evil can be perilous to the designer because even if the change is for the benefit of those affected, the designer is still cast as an enemy of people's peace of mind and their routine existence. And um, this is so important with change management. And every time I create something, I try my best to minimize the friction so that people don't feel it as much and um and when it's inevitable for for that friction to exist the communication helps set it up so that it's easier to be embraced and um and the latter two the accidental evil and the willful evil like those can be really used to measure um the kind of designer uh, and, and the quality of the design. And so here you really have to consider the character, the, um, uh, I guess also the soul of the designer because when you create something, you're embedding a part of yourself in, into what you create. And if you're being negligent, um, and careless that speaks to to um, to the designer. But then, if you're willfully uh, creating something evil, but that's uh, that's also um, I guess most obvious to to the character um, of the designer. And it's not. And and so these two are not as subjective as the first. Right. The first one, it's like, well, it exists you it, it's your really it's more of a perspective thing but then the latter two it can be judged by um by everyone else and because the design doesn't exist in a vacuum people can feel it and um can objectively uh give their feedback i think that what what was mentioned um by Mike with the whole feedback loop was really important because what I see with consultants when they create a strategy and they design a plan, uh, and I'm not um, uh, coming down on consultants because I'm like an in internal consultant, but, but they'll leave before the implementation stage and, um, and, and that, gets you off the hook because you, they no longer have skin in the game and anything that falls apart because the design um, of that strategy does not uh, stop once that contract is signed as Robert had mentioned um, and and it really comes out through the implementation with all the uh, the nitty-gritty and um, with the devil being in the details and so when I am 
because I'm an internal consultant, I'm stuck from the design phase all the way through the implementation phase. And once it's implemented, I still stay and I make sure the metrics um, are correctly captured. Uh, and if, if that's not possible, how do I go back and make um, and, and take that, that, that feedback uh, and redesign uh, or, or modify a bit um, in order to, to have this uh, emerge as something better. And it, it's, a, it's a constant iteration. And, um, and so when things are just dropped as is, there's, there's no uh, skin in the game to tie you back. You can do whatever. And, and I think that also adds to the potentiality of, of creating that evil, because if your poor planning um, doesn't, doesn't um, get connected to who you are and, and it's pinned on the implementers for, for poor design, then, um, then it, you're, you're not going to be as careful. Um, but if, if it's identified with who you are throughout everything to the end, um, then you don't want to have a bad reflection of yourself. Excellent point, uh, Becky. I mean, the, the concept of skin in the game, responsibility, and actually having to live with the consequences of your action, uh, as opposed to just doing something and going away, you know, and leaving, leaving everything for other people to, to fix. So that's beautifully, beautifully, but thank you. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us from Germany. Uh, next up, is going to be David followed by uh, Jen. David R, go ahead. So <laughs> tonight was kind of interesting because I, I read this chapter about a week ago and I, and I just finished reading a book called The, uh, the Invisible Rainbow. And um, there's some very interesting ideas in that book. And as I was getting towards the end of it, I was thinking along the lines of, from this chapter, the evil and the, the unintended consequences of design. But then CJ brought up some very interesting points, which is the paradox, which is the splendor as well as the evil. And maybe sometimes the evil is the unintended consequence because the focus is on the splendor. And then I was just actually trying to collect my thoughts right now. As Becky spoke about the, you know, in her regards with the reflection of, the, of a consultant not having to deal with the consequences of their design. And that made me wonder in, when putting it back in in perspective, so the the thought process between uh, behind the invisible rainbow is associated with electromagnetic energy, and basically our lack of understanding of its significance and its implications, and we've done a lot as a society developing our technology and utilizing electromagnetic energy in the form of waves recently and, and by recently I'm talking like you know from the, the early 1900s because this has a good historical background and I'm wondering if we've headed down a path of design with our focus on the splendor and not willing or actually looking away from the negative, which is the potential evil because, of, because we don't understand what we're doing or we don't under, really understand it. 
uh, but we think we do. And I, I don't want to go into a lot of the details because I really don't understand everything, but bringing it back to the book, it in some of the concepts that we've had today, and we talked about in today's meeting, it there is that paradox because we get we get enamored with the splendor. And as a result, are willing to not or willing to accept what could potentially be the evil. And that I find quite a concept that being brought out. And it really didn't, and this I, I, I focus back on this meetup is I would not have come away from that chapter with that, that thought process. I, I originally came away thinking about just the unintended consequences. But with the collective conversation we've had tonight, I've been able to take on a little bit of a different, more deeper perspective on how designs, and not as from an individual, but designs that are, that are moved forward through society with technology through many, many individuals and many individual designers. But as a collective, the design is moved forward by society. But the focus is always placed on the splendor and the potential unintended evil is overlooked and not, not considered. So I, I really enjoyed this meetup tonight because the the collaboration and the the interaction and the thoughts that everyone shared really had a, you know a benefit to me in being able to actually realign some of my thinking. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, David. It was great, great comments. Um, I want to bring in Marshall McLuhan's thought on this. You know, when he talks, he says, "Look, any tool, any technology." has these four impacts. Most people focus on the splendor and he uses a concept from Gestalt psychology of figure and ground. Most people are focused on the figure. The splendor is in the figure. It's right there, the thing that you're focused on. But there is a ground. There is something that is happening which is not in your conscious focal awareness. It is as real but it is outside. So he talks about that being overextension of a tool. So he says a tool extends senses, you know, the, it does something. But in the process of doing it, if you take it too far, it flips. And everything that it was supposed to, it was doing, it actually changes the ground in a negative way. And he cautions us to always look for the flip or the overextension of any design or any tool that uh, we are working with. Uh, thank you, David. Great, great comments. Uh, next up is going to be Cheng, and then we're going to do very short breakout rooms, maybe just 10 minutes, and then we will go to questions. Cheng, the floor is yours. Okay, can you see the screen? Uh, yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, you, you need to change the settings so that uh, currently it is showing two slides. If you could change the display settings. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so... Uh, as many people mentioned, uh, luckily this chapter is maybe shorter and easier to comprehend, I think, than the last few. So I just came back from my ski trip this afternoon. So I was like, oh, good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get it finished. So, I, um, so let's first summarize what it's talking about. I think we have discussed very intense about the paradox and tension in design because um, it's impossible to see the whole anything in design from one perspective. So there's always 
contradiction in design that exists at the same time. So there's a list of things that exist in design, like no, no non-attachment, attachment and uh, total engagement, the flux and permanent, knowing and naivete. So this I think is very interesting because as a designer, you want experience, you want somebody to have designed that things over and over so they doesn't make mistakes like we discussed. But at the same time, you want somebody who don't know enough so they can create something more interesting, more innovative, because if people repeat the same thing, they're usually afraid to make mistakes. They don't want to make any risk. So usually they can create some splendor that we mentioned to avoid evil. I think this is quite interesting how they coexist. The more risk to take, maybe the more splendor you will create with the risk of evil. So I found it's quite interesting through this discussion today. And also the collaboration and solitude. You need design is need collaboration, but as designer, you have to have the solitude, you have to have your idea. You can't just go along with different, like the client idea, this idea, you have to summarize, have your own idea. And the process and structure, the cyclic and episodic, uh, control and uncontrollable. So you have to control this design process. At the same time, you have to let your mind flow, you know, follow the situation. You, you can, with your intuition, all the subconsciousness, it can create something like actually, usually I found when something, there's always a challenge during the, the design process, there's something not right. But once I find a solution, usually everything else works out. So it's kind of a very interesting process. When you, at that point, you know you're in the right direction. So that's kind of like control and uncontrollable, unique and universal. So have to be unique, but also they have all these functions need to be universal, infinite, finite, timeless, and temporal. It's quite interesting because the reason I study architecture because I want something like last longer than I live. So it's kind of like human have this uh, psychology. But same time, you know, with this modern age, building don't last that long anymore. <laughs> and we move the house every few years. It's kind of sad, but that's what's going on. Splendor and evil, that's what we talked a lot earlier. The paradox relationship, an essential aspect of human ex experience. This is remind me about the Dao Te Ching we studied. You know, we studied Dao Te Ching, we totally agree with, you know, the opposite so support each other, like the Tao and the shore. You know, it's, it's a Eastern philosophy, it's very common. They admit and embrace the paradox and complex, the tension. But in Western rational thinking, we tend to avoid that, or we think that's a problem to be resolved instead of to valued. But as I said, you know, if everything is in agreement, then there's nothing, you know, that there's no excitement in human different diversity. That's why we have so many, you know, emphasis on diversity today in different uh, work environment. Because, and we also discuss about how people unfortunately tend to hang out with people exactly the same because it's easier. It's that with less effort to get along. But at the same time, without diversity, actually you can learn nothing because you repeat the same experience over and over again. And the only way you can actually, you know, improve yourself is through the difference, the diversity. And so I think that's that's something, the tension, you know. And as I mentioned, you know, I found it's uh, in America, there's so many, so many different culture. I envision this, you know, great opportunity to travel the world without going anywhere, to get along with people with different cultural background. So in my own personal experience, I found it's not that easy. So like it's easy to have miscommunication, misunderstanding with people with different culture. It's much easier to hang out with people with different culture, a similar culture. You don't even need to say anything. You never offend each other. So that's I think that's the challenge we have to face. You know, the tension as part of life to live fully, to embrace the paradox and tension. And then they talk about the evil. The good design, most interesting product, both magnificent and evil. We talk a lot about evil. So this evil is different from what we talk, the capital evil. So it's more about a tradition, traditional definition of evil is about a break unity and separate individual self from the, the whole. So it's kind of like you have to be part of this uh, group instead of like have your own reasoning and feeling and stand on your own. So design is evil when it's not, uh, 
when it's not desired, it's make manifest because designed by chance. Necessity or intention become part of the world. To a lesser degree, evil in design disrupt, disrupt balance, harmony, order, and other meaning making quality of human existence. Design can be considered evil, break taboo, like the boundary of tribe. So because design is always about creating something new, so it will always break the boundary and taboo. Otherwise, you have nothing, you know, interesting design. So that's why design is um, is considered evil in all cases. Evil is not absent of something desired, but something unsettled, undesired. So even when splendor of particular design is clearly appeared with best human intention, in, uh, there's all unexpected, unintended consequence with innovative design. So uh, because we don't know enough, like we mentioned earlier, there's three different types of evil we will discuss later. We don't understand dynamic and we introduce a new set of relationship that varies with a complex environment. So some people think uh, maybe by knowing more, understanding more of the complex reality, we can avoid this uh, evil, but then they mention it's impossible to be comprehensive. I think this was mentioned a few times in this book, which I found it quite interesting because I know CG and everybody else, we are trying to be more comprehensionist. <laughs> At the same time, we know it's impossible to be a comprehensionist. But I guess as we zoom out more, we can understand better. Maybe we don't understand the whole picture, but our map maybe is more accurate to reality than, than we don't do it, I guess. Then they talk about three types of evil, natural evil. Natural evil is unavoidable. They mentioned that they, because this is, uh, when, that's many people mentioned when you replace the old thing, they're always a loss, you know, like we, we found this very uh, familiar in our design. Right now, it's actually in America, we don't have a long history. People really want to preserve the history. Like in Seattle, we have this only uh, like uh, maybe a few years and they become historical building. Then they have to preserve it. Maybe they need to get that, uh, they need to build a hotel. Then they have to keep the facade. You know, it's kind of ironic, like because in China, we have thousands and thousands of years of history. There's so many things that we preserve all that, we can do nothing. But I think it's kind of like we grab to the past. It's memory, I think we need to keep, otherwise we, if we have the building um, all new, we don't preserve any past. It's like a, a city without memory. Like I went visit Shenzhen in China. It's a brand new city built in a few years. And when you be in that city, it was like, it's a surreal experience, it's like, is this a city? It feels like you're in a movie or science fiction. It's because there's nothing in the past. It's only present. That's, that's why I think we all love Europe because Europe has so many histories. So the past, you don't really destroy the past, you build on top of it. I think that's, that's kind of, we really talk about the natural evil. Maybe we can mitigate that evil by work with the past. Design thinking outside the box, beyond the border, boundaries, that's kind of evil. As we mentioned, that's the goal of design. We have to break boundary to create something interesting. And then design causes change, the routine of life, which is also the intention of design because we don't, we don't want to repeat. The design have to create some new ideas. You know, we are proud to be a designer with innovative ideas. But at the same time, people are grabbed. People are embrace their past like, it's kind of the, I think they mentioned about psycho psychologically, people are more afraid of change um, than embrace the future. It's like they have this fear about change. I think that's why you know design become kind of evil. Also mentioned new design always has shadow unintended consequence because um, the loss of opportunity. This is always the thing you know like when we design a building there there you you lost the chance to design another building there. So that's why I think Europe, they always have competition, which is much, much better. Like at least you have some choice before the building built, you have the choice between different design. I think that will give more compensation on this kind of uh, unintended consequence, the loss of opportunity. New design is evil because the it's material and the corporeal world. I found this is quite interesting because the material realm 
consider evil based in spiritual tradition. I thought it's quite interesting because it is true. So I recently was very interested in the uh, Bible Gita and also um, because I found there's a lot of different spiritual paths and we know, you know, that's part of the, the human growth. And I found it's interesting in Indian, there's so many different spiritual paths for people to grow. And I was listening to YouTube. There's so many different gurus, so many di different lectures and everybody listened to it. But I was amazed. And at the same time, you see their material wise, they're not as developed, but people are content. It's kind of interesting. It seems there's a contradict. And at the same time in American, you know, we just not even over COVID, but everybody is like, oh, we people buying things, people revenge buying things. <laughs> so it's like people getting gift on Christmas. So like, what a point to give gift? <laughs> like it's such a waste of resource. I was like, we should, we shouldn't just, uh, I think the materialism and the spiritual sometimes is, is conflict to my point of view. How do we achieve that balance is a challenge we have to face, I guess, in design. Then there's accidental evil, which can be avoided because of ignorance, uh, careless or inattended of uh, intentional harm. But this can be modified, mitigated with fully informed, aware of in design. I put their professional insurance here, which is my own personal experience, because you know I just had my business five, seven years. At the beginning, I didn't get insurance. I just oh, what's the point? You know, so then I realized even it's not your fault. During construction, there's so many possibilities. Anything could go wrong. It's such a complex. So even if it's not your fault, somebody could blame on you and you have to hire an attorney, which is so expensive. So in the end, you find, oh my God, I make the money and then pay for all the attorney. So professional insurance is very important. And uh, luckily, I think at this point, I think uh, to avoid this, I found it's very important to have a great team. You know, as I mentioned in construction design, there's so many unforeseen possibilities. I found if you, the problem will show up, no matter what you prepare. The important thing, you have a team, the client, the con contractor, consultant, when you face a problem, you engage, solve the problem instead of blaming each other. You know, the purpose is to, you will have the problem. The, pro the, the key is how do we get move on, solve the problem, move on. I think that's how we do it. A great team is so important. I'm still accumulate different consultant, different contractor. It takes a long time to build a house. It takes a long time to accumulate a good team, you know, to, who can work together to mitigate this, you know, evil. Then um, the most misfortune accident being the wrong place at the wrong time. Like I mentioned, you know, even though it's not your fault, somebody else like contract with the fault, but they could still blame on you and you are in the wrong place. The good design judgment, you have to have the right design knowledge, know-how, and also a good character, good designer. I found is this is quite interesting. I think just as I mentioned, you know, like good designer have not just have the knowledge, have to be a great communicator. You have to be communicate well with the client. I think that's to avoid any problems, you know, during the design construction process. I found the even I have a doctor, BG doctor, and she ended up with suit. And the reason I think because she doesn't communicate because she makes decision. Maybe she thinks it's right for the, the patient, but it's not patient's choice. She, I wasn't happy with her because she made decision for me. That wasn't my choice. And I didn't sue her, but she got sued later. I think it's important. It's in any profession. You not only have the knowledge, you have to be, have good character. You have to empathy. You have to have understanding and communication. And then the view for evil, which this is, um, I think most of us, uh, Try not to do this. I think it's more for the people in power. They have the will for evil. And uh, my my experience is uh, uh, the will for evil is the medical system, the insurance company, because uh, we all know I have experienced it so much. Like we know medical, you know, there's a health and there's the sickness, and there's a big range in between, which is between the health and sickness. And it seems we only focus on the sickness, and then you get sick, you get treatment, then you insurance pay for it. But before you get sick, you have all these opportunities. You do not get sick, but nobody will pray for it. So you end up need to be sick to get treated, which I think is an evil design of this medical system. So because of the, the money, you know, the money driven, you know, the, the whole medical system is not based on you being cured. It's based on how they make money, on you dependent on their pharmacy. 
their medicine. That's how they make money. I think the whole capitalist system is based on is kind of willful evil. This we I discussed with my son on my ski trip about this, uh, and she was in you know educated by the teacher, and then she's totally against the system. I said, did you have other solutions? Maybe you should find a solution instead of like just say this is bad. So willful evil. I think instead of punish punish the people who win capitalism, you should change the game. I said, you cannot just tax people because they, they win, because they win the game. You should change the game rule if you really want to make it fair. Then, so become good at design or help others become good at, good at design doesn't ensure a good design to be the outcome. So the theory and practice subject to human willfulness. If you're human, human, we will make mistake no matter what, no matter how Hardly try. So human beings' character cannot guarantee a good intention and magnificent of design. Design as a legitimate and sensible human activity to be supported. But evil, as CJ and many people mentioned, is part of this whole process. So what we do, you know, we have to embrace this essential nature of the design, prepare accordingly. So I found this, this is quite interesting. At the end, I think um, David also mentioned that. I found it's quite inspiring because it's just like when we go ski, you know, we know there's a risk. We know we will fail, but we still try. Same as design because it's, we know we could mistake. Is that the reason we don't do design? No, we still take the risk, do the design. And we learn along the way. That's why experience is so important. Experience help us avoid unintended you know, unintended consequence as much as we can with the experience. But I think, as I mentioned, you know, design, is, uh, building architecture is not rocket science. You know, even I design something I never did, I will take the chance to do it. I learn through my experience. And the important thing is like, we have the, we have the courage to facing all the potential problem. We accepting the challenge and we, accepting the power of design because we create something that's in the real world that cannot be undone. Not like computer, undo, undo, then it's gone. You make mistake, it will show up and it will stay there for a while. So, and we have to, accepting the responsibility of design to serve others and accountability. We have to keep improving our, our skill and understand the evil of design. And at the same time, I think in the end, I found it's quite uh, encouraging, it's like, we understand all this complexity, but at the same time, we still have to keep our courage to make a change in the human world because of the potential design. Because we, I see a lot of people who try to avoid making mistakes. So they don't do anything new. They just repeat, repeat the same thing, you know, like that's not design, that's, that's copying. You know, that's the worst thing you can do as a designer. So in order to innovate, we have to take certain type of risk. We have to, Accepting all these challenges at the same time, we have to embrace, remember the splendor of design, reach beyond the grasp, potential, and consequence of evil. So basically in the end, we understand all this drawback, all this evil, all this potential. We have to inspire by the splendor of design and take the risk because design can create truly sublime. This imperfect designer, unpredictable, dangerous world it's all this worst bad combination. You can screen, still create something splendid, sublime. And with restrict limits, imperfect imperf design situation, imperfect of designers, you can still accommodate hope and aspiration of every human being. So it's, I think the end is pretty hopeful. You know, we, it's kind of like warning us, you know, all this potential, but in the end we have to, because of potential, the opportunity, the splendor of design, we have to take risk. Despite all this evil, potential evil, I think that really takes courage. Just like you go ski, you could fall, you know, but you still go. And as you ski, you get better. So <laughs> you, then you, you're on the steep slope, you don't, you're not afraid. I mean, you don't afraid, you actually won't fall anymore. So I think that's kind of in the end. So human designer fully participate in the tension of doing good and evil. Like uh, CG mentioned, it's part of the part of the nature in anything. There's a good and evil coexisting, and because we inspired by the good, we are not deterred by the evil. So we keep designing and design culture as cu cu uh, 
crucible for this intense and demanding work. So we need to create this design culture and to encourage the other to design. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cheng. Uh, folks, we are going to do the breakout rooms only for 10 minutes uh, as we are running short of time. And then we come back with the best questions that we have. Starting the breakout rooms now, uh, they're going to be led by, uh, facilitated by CJ, Maritza, and Mike. Starting the breakout rooms now. But uh, welcome back, folks. Welcome back. Uh, let's do one thing. We don't have too much time. And I do want to do the uh, Q&A. So let's do the Q&A. Um, I don't know how, how you guys came back, but you, you're back. So let's let's go ahead and do the Q&A. Uh, it was such an interesting um, range of thoughts. I think this was definitely one of the best uh, meetups that we have had in this series, I think. That's just my, my sense of it. I don't know what you guys think, but um, let's come up with questions. So let's put the best questions that we have on the table. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark uh, if you have uh, any questions. Okay, we'll start with CJ. CJ1, CJ2, Abraham, Kevin. But I'm going to give Kevin the preference of asking the questions because he, I didn't notice that he had asked to speak before and we didn't have time for it. Kevin, what's your question? Thank you, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, in design, who is responsible for to consider evil for design? Okay, who is responsible? Very good. Uh, next up is going to be uh, CJ. CJ. Yeah, I, I had uh, two questions. Um, one question is about this willful evil. And in my enterprising reading of the book, I think willful evil comes as a consequence of our values, whatever they are. So even if your values are service and to make the world better and whatnot, does that value your will to honor your values inherently and necessarily create the possibility of unsettling or undesirable consequences, which the book defines as evil. And, and the, the second question I have relates to the last paragraph in the book, which says, the splendor of design reaches beyond the grasp of the potential and actual consequences of evil. Is that a religious belief? Is there any reason why we should believe that the splendor of design necessarily reaches beyond the grasp of the potential and actual consequences of evil? Or can we develop some scientific confidence? Or do we just have to take that as religious faith? All right, fantastic questions as always, CJ. What's the connection between values and willful evil? I'll, I'll put it in a more general way for people so people can comment on anything. And is splendor primary and always overpowers the evil or what is the relationship between splendor and evil and what, what's the dance between them? Uh, next up is going to be Abraham, Joe, Ambika, and Cheng. Abraham, what's your question? Uh, yeah, I, I, it was really good. Uh, the, so if we look at human history, I hopefully not, but some of my ancestors would have been murderer. Some of ancestors must have been rapists. What uh, I'm saying, a lot Abraham, of, Abraham, try to put it as a question. Yeah, 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 we're yeah. going to discuss so all of it. Go ahead. Background. Without sure. that, it's hard sure. to understand the concept. Sounds good. Sounds good. So the reason I don't know that is there is no internet, although there is no technology we have now. So that keeps me sane, OK? But now, let's say going forward 1,000 years, if someone is interested in, they will know one sixteenth of them is murderer. 
one uh, one one out of hundred twenty eight is let's say uh, many evil people let's say so many things are open in the form of remembrance but before we we time was healer so you guys what so I think the uh, forgetfulness in many cases is unintended good but un unlike we think but remembering we think is remembering truth remembering uh, justice we think it's a goodness right most cases but in this case it will be cursed to the future generation so I'd like to ask question question is before time was a healer forgetfulness was granted to humanity but now Technology is interrupting this this whole human uh, way of doing things. Yeah, that's my question. So, what do you think? Wonderful. So, the, I will put it as the memory brought about by the digital age is that a healer or is that a bane? Next up is Joe, Ambika, Jang, and Becky. Joe. Yeah. So the book. Um... <laughs> Uh, goes into designers are not self-serving, but other serving. What does that exactly mean? What does other serving mean to everyone else in here? Wonderful. Uh, what does other serving mean? Very good. Uh, next up is Ambika, Jang, and Becky. Ambika, what's your question? Why are we so willing to be deceived and live with deception so we don't wake up to ask for what is true and authentic. Excellent, excellent question. Why are we willing to be deceived? Excellent. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Jenk. Yeah, I think to avoid evil, you need a, a system like counterbalance system, basically. I think there need an evaluation system to be in structure to uh, mitigate, avoid evil in design. So I wonder how we should set that up. Wonderful. What evaluative or corrective system we can institute or put together to correct for evil? Uh, next up is going to be Becky. Mine is actually the same as Jeng's, except I don't know if I would use the word correct. Maybe minimize. Minimize. Okay. One. Very good. So I'll I'll modify it to minimize. How how do you minimize evil by building a system? Uh, next up is Allison, followed by Jeff. Allison. Um, <clears throat> dancers use opposition all the time, and you use it to create balance and to create strength but also to create a feeling of stability in the dance, but then they will purposely go against that to create a feeling of dissonance and anxiety in the audience when they want a certain effect and do other artists and designers do that as well. Wonderful. Um, do designers uh, deliberately create a sense of disorientation um, in, in, in the design to achieve certain purposes. Very good. Uh, next up is uh, Jeff. Jeff, what's your question? So mine is um, what questions could we employ with ourselves and, and those we wish to serve and, and those with whom we contract to serve in a designer role to continually address the unavoidable evil of design? Okay, what questions should we should we be asking to avoid this evil? All right, fantastic questions, folks. Okay, so let's see where shall we start. Um, so I really I, I want to do the broader questions first. So the connection between splendor and evil. I think that's an excellent kind of a high level question here. Uh, the second one is the issue of kind of corrective systems. You know, what, what can we do to do that? And we'll put questions as a part of that. Um, 
so let's look at it that look at this uh, with with that. So, so firstly, what is the connection between splendor and evil? Is it as the authors say at the end that splendor reaches beyond evil? Is that always true? In what cases is it true? Um, what is the relationship between splendor and evil? If you'd like to answer it, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Uh, Maritza followed by Evanik. Maritza. I think I would say the answer is uh, yes and no. It's this concept of because both exist within us, it's kind of a push-pull effect. You may have one more dominant with the other. And I think that the um, the connection is meaning. In order for us to reach the splendor, we are, you know, that's the soulfulness within the design. And to get there, we have to go through meaning. And I think that that's, that's the connection there. The evil of design helps to shape, it's what gives the design the meaning because if it is no risk, you don't hold it in esteem. And so it becomes meaningful in the acknowledgement and acceptance of the fact that the evil does exist and you're gonna somehow manage to acknowledge it, circumvent it and push past it to find the splendor. And that's what gives it the meaning. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Maritza. Next up is Evanique, Cheng, Robert, and Joe. Evanique. Yeah, I think it's a, um, a light and darkness thing. So the splendor is the light and the evil is the darkness. But I don't see the darkness as bad because you need the darkness to know what light is. So I think if you're looking at design, the evil has to, uh, the, the evil has to come and in order for you to see the splendor of it, of the design. So you have to go through all of the negative outcomes and the negative negativity that it'll have on people, unfortunately, in order to have the splendor of the design. And I was also thinking like a yin yang thing, like you, you need both, like they seem opposite, but they actually come together beautifully. And like, I think of it because most of the times when you see the yin and the yang, you see the white and the black. And I think that they have to come together. There's no splendor without evil and there's no evil without splendor. You need both um, and, and both are needed and both are necessary and both are integral in creating a design. Wonderful, thank you, Evanique. Next up is Cheng, Robert and Joe. Cheng. Yeah, I think Evanik uh, took my answer because <laughs> I was trying to say exactly the same thing, yin and yang, and light and dark. And I think the reason we focus on the splendor instead of the shadow, because uh, it's just like people, you can be optimistic if you look at the bright side of the things, or you can be pessimistic, look at the dark side of the things, and they coexist anyway. And also, I listened to the hidden brain on the way, and they mentioned about how the background, the foreground, how they can play with each other. So the, then they tell a story about how this person can be both good and evil. And this time I realized they need a third party because there's only kind of like make sure, just like democratic process, make sure the evil doesn't go out of control. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Jang. Next up is Robert. Robert, go ahead. Um. Actually, splendor is a preferred state over evil. Uh, evil exists, it's very real, and it's always present. Uh, it may or may not manifest itself in, in the design that you're doing, design work that you're doing, but you always have to be on the lookout for that. And as I mentioned before, um, one way of doing that is to appoint an evil committee to do the search for the evil. And that's acknowledging the evil as uh, Evanique was talking about, but it's not condescending to the evil. It's in order to expose it and to manipulate accordingly. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, next up is Joe, Becky, Ambika, and Kevin. Joe. I'll just be very brief. I, th I think of this as like kind of chaos and order and where you're bringing things into order with Splendor mm -hmm. and um, this idea that how you um, essentially, uh, you know, you're able to do that um, by essentially, uh, essentially pushing beyond the boundaries which is what one of the, uh, I think I forget which one it was, was natural evil. Um, so that if you're able to push beyond the boundaries, you're able to create order out of chaos. And so I, that's kind of, I look at it as a duality. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. And folks, what I'm going to do is that at the end of this meetup, I'm going to give you a preview of uh, a meetup I'm going to do on Saturday. And that deals with this way, I did a meetup on comparing the Bible, Bhagavad Gita, and the Tao. And all these three works talk a lot about splendor and evil and the nature of splendor and nature of evil. And so I'm going to give you a preview of that. And I've, what I've realized is that another architect, Louis Sullivan, whom I, I love and who has been the primary influence on me, um, he has a way of thinking about this topic. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. So I'll give a short preview if after this meetup is over for anybody who wants uh, uh, of that. Um, so next up is going to be Becky, Ambika, and Kevin. Becky. I think that it it's something that I had mentioned earlier about like subjectivity and objectivity. And with uh, the natural evil, like it exists, right? There's that polarity that Joe had mentioned um, and with that, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's that balance that Allison was also talking about. But with the other two evils, um, it's, it's, you can't really have that objective approach. You have to um, be more proactive to work against it. Now, when you're working with a tool, it is extremely objective. It is how you use it um, will can be good or bad. But when you're talking about design, you're talking about intention, and your intention can be good or bad. And um, and when you're you're not factoring in through negligence, that falls into the second evil. And if you're purposely put, um, injecting uh, evil that falls into the last category. So these guardrails really need to be put in and it's not, they're, they're just not the same way to be looked at or treated. And so like what Robert has said, that evil committee is a pretty <laughs> fascinating <laughs> suggestion um, to treat the, the latter two. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Next up is Ambika. Ambika, what do you see as a relationship between splendor and evil? Well, I was wondering if the evil source can also create visions of splendor. And that, you know, we've seen that happen. And or once that is created, return to an evil act um, after the fact as well. So um, it is quite interesting where there is a darkness which is not evil there's a darkness which is comfort and darkenment a spiritual process but then there is the other one which becomes evil and so the Taj Mahal what did Shah Jahan do when it was finished after 23 years he chopped off the hands of the makers of the artisans and, and that is horrid evil so, thank you thank you Ambika uh, very interesting distinction between kind of just darkness and evil uh, next up is uh, Kevin, followed by Mike. Kevin. It's very interesting. I'm going to try to follow the uh, big one example. Back to 1930, you think about ideology. Community is so popular, commonplace in Western. Now, upside it down. Get it. Uh, my point is here. In, um, I would consider evil and, uh, and the goodness. Use a codon. Use a codon. A, X, uh, X axis uh, X, basic horizontal axis. You can see they could be inter interchangeable just now, like the 
uh, it will become the, the good, good become the evil. However, even that based uh, uh, James uh, presentation, it's one. When you go far to perfect one direction, another intention, this is a paradox and a tension come up play. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Next up is Mike. Mike, you got one minute. Oh, wonderful. Uh, every project is both good and evil, especially when you consider uh, economic impact, when you consider safety issues, you build a wonderful building and it, uh, it does all kinds of wonderful things. Then uh, 30 years later, it collapses and kills 80 people. So you, you need metrics to, and uh, these are nonlinear. So you have to, uh, some of it is subjective, at least today. And you have to de uh, develop this. Metrics will help. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next up is going to be Marco, Abraham, and CJ. Marco. Um, maybe it's sort of like the subconscious and the and the conscious mind, where it's sort of like, you know, you need the um, you need the the darkness to to come into the light. That the that splendor is sort of like the hidden light. Um, you know, from coming from evil. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Next up is Abram followed by CJ. Abram, what do you think? Yeah. So, so again, it, it was a wonderful, uh, different way to look at it. Uh, but I think there, there is confusion about the, the words, again, as a philosopher, let's say here, splendid and evil. So let's say in philosophy, there are major areas, uh, the metaphysics, talking about existence and time cause and things like that. And epistemology, talking about knowledge, ethics, how to live, aesthetics, what is beauty. I think in that each even domain, we can see which one is desirable, which one is not, right? And religion try to incorporate them, all of them, they make narratives, right? But when we look at our lives, everyday life, we don't think about these aspects only all the time. We, we work food and people argue politics and things like that. So what I'm saying is if we try to narrow it down into certain domain, let's say metaphysics or uh, knowledge, certain things, we can have more precise, I mean, this is comprehensive approach. I really like it, that's my style. But uh, people talking each other, sometimes I, uh, we might be talking different things actually in the name of splendor and evil. Good point, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be CJ and then we'll go to the next question, CJ. Uh, it's it's very difficult. I'm in, I'm in mostly inclined to agree with Evanique and the others who said it's like yin and yang. And that leads me to believe that the book, when it says the splendor of design reaches beyond the grasp of the potential and actual consequences of evil, is merely just playing a cheerleader role to encourage us to do it anyway. Um, but but then I, I wonder, maybe in the actual mechanics of how the world works, because, you know, the evil is the unsettling or the undesirable, but our desires change. And maybe in our psychology, we're always trying to deal with the reality that's thrust upon us. And so maybe we just accept a lot of the evil as tolerable and we get over being so unsettled. So maybe it is true that the splendor reaches beyond the evil, but maybe it's because we just adapt to it and declare it to be not so bad after all. But maybe that shows that the evil was equal to the splendor, but we changed the goalpost to let splendor win. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. The next big question is about, is the one that Jeng brought up. 
how how do we come up with some system some way some procedures of evaluating and minimizing evil in design how do we do that go ahead and type exclamation mark if you would like to answer we'll start with joe okay i'm going to answer this but the person that really should be answering this is jeff um it's the idea of having uh aligning incentives with what your actual values are um so i mean I, and we have to be careful what we're calling evil as well because you know that people have these values they're just different than ours and they they may not be you know in alignment with our uh, with our perspective on the world but that they believe it to be you know that, that these uh, you know that their systems are the best systems to uh, address society's needs uh so um but I think the most important thing is to align incentives with the desired outcomes that you really want. And I think that that's the only real way to, uh, to think about design within a system. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Next up is uh, Jang, Evanique, and Mike. Jen. Yeah, I know there's a, like there's a design committee for the very important building in the city. Like they have to review it, make sure it's, you know, it's good for the less evil <laughs> to destroy the city. And also I think for the personal small business, there's should be like uh, quality control, which is hard to do with small business I found. Like maybe bigger company have quality control to avoid the unintended evil, your mistakes. So I think there's need to be more in place because uh, the design committee, usually the board member, their aesthetic or their principle, or their goal may be different from the community, you know, and the people who are really dominant in those may not represent the variety of the, you know, the community. I think that's the problem. Uh, thank you, Jen. Next up is Evanique followed by Mike. Evanique. Yeah, um, when I was in my former job, we like a part of what we did was process, processes and managing that. And the one thing we had to do is we had to look at our intention. Like, what do we want this process to do? Um, and it's the same, like, so it would be similar to design. Like, what do you want the design to do? And then you look at ways, things that could happen that could derail the intention, not necessarily the design or the process, but the intention. And then you look at, then you look for things that you can't predict, right? Like there's things that just going to happen and like, how are you going to deal with that? Are you going to schedule meetings to evaluate like what unpredict, like what we did was we had meetings during the process while people were actually trying out this new system. It was a new contract management system. And what we did was we had meetings to check in with everybody that was in, well, not everybody, but representatives from each office that were involved in the process. And we changed it right there. So there were things that we couldn't see but we had planned on dealing with that by setting aside some time to evaluate. So I think it's the key in any system is to set aside time to evaluate the evils that you did not predict to come up and then to deal with them right then and there and, and keep trying and doing that all throughout the whole life of the design. Thank you, Evanique. Next up is uh, Mike. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, uh, again, it goes back to metrics. Uh, chapter six in the preface discuss how to uh, how to score even subjective things and uh, put them in a mode where you can compare uh, the costs of uh, of uh, failing, uh, the cost of d doing uh, consequential damage, uh, uh, and uh, that scoring uh, in large projects is often implemented by a red hat committee that uh, that is separate from the project and is designed to ensure that quality and minimize impact con non, uh, consequential impact and that's uh, uh, on large projects that's a good thing to do uh, uh, and uh, uh, done, so, that's, by, that's done by people who have uh, 
who are not directly involved in thing, but by knowledgeable subject matter experts. Thank you. Excellent, excellent point, uh, Mike. Thank you. Next up is uh, Maritza followed by Ambika. Maritza. I, I think that maybe the question is, how do we make peace with the evil that we find along the way? I, I think that attempting to banish or um, do away with evil is, a path towards um, analysis paralysis. Um, and if we um, accept that the evil will be there, it's much easier to roll with it. And I think that that's the way that we minimize the evil. If we are less rigid in our view of the design process and we expect that we will find evil, we mitigate it in that manner by ensuring that what we can control, those details are well-defined, well-identified, and then we are ready to move when we find something that needs addressed and corrected because we've identified it as an evil in our design process. Um, I, I think that um, Joe makes a good point that evil is subjective. So what's evil in my design process might not be evil in someone else's design process, but there's the also the idea of if the design process involves a community of people and all are being vigilant, then there's no need really to be afraid of this evil that's looming somewhere. It's a matter of bring it into the fold, make it just another piece of the puzzle. And then in that way, it just becomes lesser. It's like we spoke about the, you know, that dinosaur that's ignored, it just gets bigger and bigger. But the second you give it attention and you focus upon it, it begins to shrink and become more manageable. That's the way I think is a healthier way to view the evil within one's design process. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Uh, Ambika, what systems can we devise in order to minimize evil? I think when we begin a collaboration with a group of people, it might be smart to have a few points to consider whether when we meet up for the different meetings that we are not a projecting anything because I mean, things do come up. And so if you check in with yourself and then check in with each other that things aren't going all right. Um, so there is open and clear communication because it's easy sometimes for things to get cross purposes at cross purposes. How do we prevent that? And having it come up to, air, to, to, to clear out doubts and cogs and things like that would be something smart to do both, but also energetically. Um, and there are ways to clear energetically also for each other and so on um, and not overlook um, something important. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambika. Next up is going to be Becky, Alison, Robert, and CJ. Becky. I think that what Mike had said about metrics was interesting um, because I'm, I'm always about measuring metrics, but it's also a metrics and communication because as soon as you let people know what you're measuring, um, and and uh, that metric, they can manipulate it so that you um, no longer can use that metric anymore. And an example would be like, um, you, without someone knowing, um, you can measure the quantity of submissions um, uh, processed, but. Um, or, or, or something less direct, but then it's like, oh, well, now that I know that, let me, what I can do is I can duplicate or I can um, create a bunch of things that defeat the ultimate purpose of that metric because there are these two ways of differentiating metrics. It's like a lead metric and then a lag metric. And the lead metric is what you can measure immediately and the lag metric is what you ultimately want to measure, but that comes less out of your control. And so it goes back to what Harold was saying 
of short-term and long-term um, consequences. What you can see immediately is gonna be different from what you see um, later on and how you interact with those two have to be very different. Um, and with, um, it, it also ties in with the aligning the incentives too, because um, I think a lot of times our systems, uh, especially for doctors, I think Jeng had mentioned something like that, the healthcare system, it's like it, you, you can tie things short term because it's so immediate um, and there's not so much uh, error for attributing the results and the consequences to something else. But then how about the long-term effects? It's like the, you, you also have to have a different strategy for that because, um, because they're real, but it's harder. Um, you know, people leave, people, uh, so many things happen. So um, aligning the incentives would be really um, important. And then the last part would be adequate friction. We always talk about this. I think um, like having group think and um, working with people who are so compatible with you um, is, is like the default um, when it comes to hiring a group, but it's not uh, good for being comprehensive and uh, it, it, you need that slowdown in order to cover more ground so that you're not uh, being uh, blinded. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Becky. Next up is Allison, uh, followed by Robert and CJ. Allison. Um, I think that you need guidelines um, and communication because guidelines, sometimes people break rules because they didn't really know that they were a rule. So people need to be really clear about what, you know, this is the, these are the guidelines for achieving this so that they know what to do really. Um, and then I think, you know, communication is part of that. Um, people really have to be able to communicate. And I think that, um, you know, like this whole online world we've been in is a real example of that. I mean, I find the people I work with when we were remote, there were so many disagreements because we were misunderstanding each other. And then once we were back in person, we could just sit there and talk about it. And it was resolved like immediately. And sometimes I even find someone's, you know, they're texting back and forth, back and forth. And I just got enough. I get up, I walk down the hallway. <laughs> I go talk to them. I'm like, all right, I don't understand what you're trying to say. You know, and then we talk about it and, we, and you figure it out and it's just easier. Um, so I think that's really important with anything with, you know, kind of design or anything really to have that communication. Wonderful. Thank you, Alison. Next up is Robert. Robert, go ahead. I think that um, we have to learn to apprehend evil within the design effort and without the design effort. And uh, we have to expect evil intuitively. And then we have to gauge it by knowing its intention, you've got to find out what they're up to before you can apply a metric or uh, make a decision, basically, whether or not it's just a shade of darkness or very destructive, chaotic evil. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Next up is CJ. CJ, you need to unmute. Sorry, everyone's covered aspects of it, which I would summarize as adequate comprehensiveness and adequate communication. But I think the one and only real way to deeply and effectively mitigate all the potential evils is improving our judgment, um, judgment building exercises like managing a chronophile, taking very careful case studies of past projects, of projects you weren't involved with, to really more deeply understand 
how things can be perceived as evil. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, CJ.